Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider and uh, maybe a belated uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, right now, the industry is getting very busily ready for the legislature, which is going to open here shortly. And uh, as usual, we probably expect uh, another 30 to 50 bills to be introduced to affect condo living. If you don't understand how the legislature works, it's a biennial legislature. So the bills that were introduced in 2021 that did not get a hearing, maybe um, nothing happened, but those bills are considered all still active today. Uh, it doesn't really worry us because rarely do we ever see those bills uh, come back to life. Uh, and many of them were kind of duplicative of, of bills that did get a hearing. So. Uh, the subject matter was very similar. So, uh, uh, but we have to be prepared and we have a list of the 50 or so bills that didn't get a hearing and we'll expect another 50 bills on some new topic or redundant topic we've uh, dealt with for years. And, uh, and I'll guess the wine consumption and beer consumption in America will double or triple during the next two or three months. And rightfully so, I may add. Well, anyway, it's a new year, and by now you should have adopted, if you're a, a calendar year basis condo, you should have adopted an annual budget for 2022. And I thought it might be helpful to go through what the requirements are, and you can ask yourself whether your association budget passes or fails the test. <laughs> on how the budget was prepared and how that includes a reserve study and what the basic requirements are under the condo statute. <clears throat> now I can tell you, I've been doing this for years and I have a very bad view about this subject because very few condos in the state of Hawaii put forth the proper disclosures. They may give the owners a budget and may have income expenses, et cetera, reserve contributions. But when you look at the statute, what all the requirements are for the budget to be proper, I find most associations don't pass this test. And it'd be so simple to have a one page summary that says, here's the answers to these questions and comply with the statute. <clears throat> I'm not so sure how scared that makes me because I'm not sure what the um, results would be. Uh, if someone tried to push that claims, uh, sorry, if the budget's there, they have a right to set the maintenance fees. And, uh, but the reality of it is, the truth be told, <clears throat> they don't typically comply with all the requirements of the statute. So we're going to go through that just briefly today and give you kind of an overview. And then you can ask yourself, did your association pass the test? <clears throat> Let's begin first with the general concept of preparing a budget. <clears throat> the question I ask is, are you an up, bottom up or a bottom down kind of a budget? And by that I mean as follows. You say my goal is not to raise maintenance fees, so I'm gonna plug the numbers so that I don't have to raise maintenance fees, or if I do, they're very nominal. Or you say, here's my realistic look at the expenses in case hurrah, hurrah, <clears throat> here's what we're really going to deal with. And that's what the maintenance fees are. I see too often that association boards think it's their duty not to raise maintenance fees. And they do things to create lower operating costs. The number one thing they probably do is push the reserve contributions down to make the numbers work. And, uh, fudge the reserve study to try to make this uh, um, uh, all balanced, which uh, is kind of like the old Fram oil filter commission, a commercial, pay me now or pay me later. Uh, these types of things are only gonna hurt uh, the association and it'll hurt them bigger and more effective in the short run when these real expenses uh, come due. It makes no sense to say these are our operating expenses, knowing they're going to be higher, knowing you won't have the money to put in reserves, and then someday down the road, you don't have enough money in reserves, so you have to do a special assessment and or a loan. 
I would caution everybody to tell you that with that collapse of that uh, condominium in Florida, there's a great deal of legislative pressure, including Hawaii, on tightening up the requirements on the reserve study and putting potentially punitive measures in if you don't follow certain basic rules on the reserve study. It's kind of been lightly enforced. Uh, there's been lawsuits on this matter, but uh, I'm expecting there to be some onerous bills out there uh, trying to uh, prevent that from happening under the concept that uh, owners, while they live there, should pay their share of uh, the capital costs or the, or the depreciation, as we say, for the roof and things like that. So let's go through the basic questions on on uh, this show. It's a 30-minute show about, and uh, we're going to talk in the, uh, the first part of the show about the operating costs, and then the second part of the show about reserve contributions. And I'll try to just give you the test. Well, the first test is, first question is, what are the requirements under the statute to do a, a, a budget? And the first thing you have to do is you have to estimate an income or revenue or regular assessments. Some of you may think that that's maintenance fees. Well, it is maintenance fees, but the test statute refers to the income you charge on a monthly basis, the quote maintenance fee, unquote, as a regular assessment. A special assessment would be to deal with some surprise condition like a roof or some other economic problem that your association has, has affected. But uh, the correct terminology is it's called regular assessments with regard to uh, the income you receive. The second question is, what do you have to put in the budget to say, and what do you have to disclose to make it a valid budget according to 514B? Okay, the first thing is you must estimate revenue and expenses. Well, revenue is gonna be regular assessments, maybe sub-metering of electricity, uh, maybe you have some incidental income from vending machines or parking income or things along that line um, that you can uh, make as revenue. You might even have a special assessment over a period of years that you're counting on to help pay the loan or, or just to um, pay the cost of what you're planning to special assess for. So the first thing is you have to estimate revenue expenses and probably every budget does that. You probably all get an A for that particular portion of the budget. The next thing is the budget needs to disclose whether it was prepared on a cash or accrual basis of accounting. I find very few budgets where it'd be very easy to add a little footnote at the bottom, prepared using the accrual method of accounting, prepared using the cash method of accounting. Probably most people prepare their budget, whether they're doing their books this way, but on, on an accrual basis, they say, well, insurance is $12,000 a year, it's $1,000 a month over 12 months. And so and that's basically accrual accounting where a cash accounting would say, well, yeah, with insurance is 12,000 a year, but we pay the um, a premium quarterly. So we're gonna be charging $3,000 a quarter on uh, in one month specifically. Uh, with respect to that. But at the end of the day, because the budget's annual in basis, although a lot of management companies give you a monthly uh, projection, um, it's, it's, it's basically a requirement to disclose those cash or accrual accounting. A good example would be the auditor fee. How many times you do the auditor fee? It's usually once a year for that in the tax returns. Well, you're going to have more money going out that month. And if the auditor fees $2,400, that's $200 a month. <clears throat> if that's what you're putting in your budget, then you're doing it on a cool basis. If you're saying it's $2,400 and we pay it in November, then it's cash basis. But the real bottom line is the statute says you have to disclose it. So if you don't have a sentence in there somewhere saying this is prepared using the cash or cool method of accounting, you get an F. And I would say probably 90% of you get an F because you don't do that. And I don't understand why, because it's such a simple thing to put a footnote at the bottom of how you prepared it. The other statutory requirements in your annual budget 
Uh, the misnomer, and I'm going to deal with more of this after the break, is, is the reserve contributions. Your reserve contributions, you aren't spending, you're saving the you, money for uh, something in the future. I've often said that when you look at, you only had one component of a million dollars every 10 years, you would every year assess 100,000 to all the owners, and then you would uh, get a million, you'd spend a million to fix the whatever, and then you'd be back to zero and just start all over again. But what the law says is you must disclose in your annual budget, the total amount of money you have in the reserve account. It seems to me very simple to say the total estimated reserve, because you're doing this kind of in September, October, and you, and you would be projecting what your balance is going to be January 1. So it seems easy enough to me to say the projected beginning balance for January 1, 2022, and our reserve account is $1 million and be done with it. And, but I give probably most of you an F in the sense you may disclose it to the extent you provided a reserve study with your budget, but it just seems so easy to me for you to have a one page disclosure on your budget that just deals with the statutory requirements to say, the estimated reserve beginning balance as of January 1, 2022 is $1,000,000 We've taken into consideration expenses for the balance of the year and income received for reserve contributions in the balance of the year. And our projected balance on January 1 is 2022. Maybe you don't think that's important, but let me tell you that I deal all year long as an expert witness on lawsuits where the attorneys who get a hold of this stuff, they basically say, well, that's what the law says. Well, where is it? Well, it's on this page in the reserve study. But doesn't it seem a lot easier just to have a one-page disclosure for the budget? So anyway, the next thing is you have to have an estimate of reserves to maintain the property. In the Hawaii law and its administrative rules, they call that the estimated replacement reserves. That always angered me because of the fact when you look at national standards and the language we use from CAI and other national reserve study organizations, they call it reserve contributions, but we have to call it in Hawaii, estimated replacement reserves. I don't know where that came from in 1995 when they wrote this thing. I have often debated and argued uh, uh, that you should um, have a situation where um, um, uh, you use the national standards, we should amend the administrative rules and uh, they could say estimated replacement reserves also known as reserve contributions. So people don't get confused because when they get the reserve study, they get confused. So anyway, there has to be an explanation on how the reserve study was calculated. They have to have what the reserve study says the contribution should be. It's not leftover cash flow that here's all the operating expenses. And if they're higher than they should, whatever's left over, we're gonna put in the reserve study. You have to do a reserve study that says, to maintain the property, this is the contribution amount. And then you have to finally disclose that you do your funding plan under the reserve study using a cash basis or a cash flow or a percent funded method of analysis. And it just seems to me as a reserve person, you could very, or as a budget person or as an association, you could very easily write a disclosure that addresses all of these issues up front because there's some penalties if you don't do it right. And on that note, because that's kind of a brief summary of the operating side, we're going to take a one minute break so you can go get a beer or a glass of wine because this is probably going, whoa, what do I get myself into? But anyway, we'll be right back in one minute. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years. And we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my two books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, which is about leadership, success, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. Please tune in and watch my show every Monday at 11 a.m. on Think Tech Hawaii and on YouTube. Aloha. 
I'm Prince Dykes, the host of the Prince of Investment, the financial literacy and business show that comes to you live every other Thursday at 4 p.m. Hawaii time. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and wherever you can catch podcasts. I'll see you there. I'm back. Hopefully you uh, got a quick break. And we're going to talk more about the budget, but just to review the basic disclosure under the statute, you have to provide an estimate of revenue expenses, whether the budget was prepared on the cash or cool basis of accounting, the total amount of money in your reserve account, the estimated reserves, reserve contributions required pursuant to a reserve study to maintain the property, a description of how you calculated that contribution, and whether that was done on a percent funded or a cash flow funding method, as far as um, the uh, uh, funding plan and how you came about those conclusions. I would tell you that there are sorts of penalties within the administrative rules that if in fact you use statistics to manipulate the results every year, um, you know, Mark Twain popularized Benjamin Israeli's statement that there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. And uh, the law has punitive measures in there for uh, you or against you if, if you use the different funding techniques off and on different ways in an effort to uh, avoid the requirements of a reserve study. And so there's all sorts of kind of penalties that exist out there. But let's talk about the obligation of the reserve study, which is a part of the annual budget. The question I always get, and people get confused, is that when you look at CAI, Community Association Institute, they actually define reserve studies into three categories, level one, level two, and level three. Level one is the most onerous in the sense that you've got to call contractors, you've got to get um, numbers from people. On occasion, you may have an architect or an engineer look at the spalling. We really do a lot more retail detail as far as uh, uh, how you came up with your numbers. Uh, the industry recommends that about every five years. Uh, the lowest level is a level three, and a level three is you're basically taking your prior reserve study and saying, well, we didn't do the roof this year, we're gonna do it next year. And, or we did do the roof and we projected 200,000, cost 230,000. And you're basically updating the data within the, within the uh, reserve study without a site visit. The level one requires a site visit and independent analysis or, or numbers from a, a vendor or architect or somebody. Level two is kind of in between where you've done a site visit, you've updated the numbers but you haven't gone to the effort of contacting the vendors or the architect. And then level five, one, as I said, is uh, recommended every five years or so. Uh, level uh, three, which is recommended or required every single year at a minimum, because the reserve study, the law says the budget shall include a reserve study. So you can't just use a two or three year old reserve study. You've got to update that every year based on what you would believe current information because you're postponing or doing and things are costing more or less and it needs to be updated and doing those things uh, gives you actually really good work product. Level two, they say every two to three years. Some people don't know there's another study called level four, which is for developers for new projects that are under construction or haven't been built yet. Uh, you know, we have some bizarre laws here in Hawaii that developers don't have to do a reserve study when they estimate their reserve contributions and do their initial public report that I am confident you'll see in the legislature this year, uh, laws that try to force them to do a level four reserve study. The rationale behind that is all these new projects, all these owners are complaining, particularly the affordable housing owners, at the end of the day, as soon as the board takes over, these maintenance fees are going up 50, 60, 70 percent. I've seen developer public reports that show zero for reserve contributions and estimating the maintenance fees under the concept that the association doesn't have to do a reserve study until the first full fiscal year following the formation of the board. But that's not really what the law says. We look at 514B. Well, I forget the numbers, either nine or 38, but uh, they have to do an accurate estimate of maintenance fees. And it's not the current year, it's, it's 
kind of what you can expect to pay. It's kind of a common thing. You'd want people who are buying to know what they're really getting into. I hate to think of the, I've seen it with some cases I'm involved in where owners all of a sudden walked in and got a 70% increase in maintenance fees. And it's an affordable housing project of new first time buyers. Does that seem fair that they didn't do some work to figure out what the real numbers are? And, and so anyway, but back to the reserves and the requirements in the law. You have to do a reserve study every year. It has to be a part of the budget. And you can pick a level one, two, or three, or you can do it yourself as a board. But you should put some time in it because you need to define all of the components over, are you ready? $1,000 in value. So if it's a common element, over $1,000 in value, it has to be included in the reserve study. Now, what most people do, because the law provides for those components less than 10,000, you can bundle them together. So you might see a whole bunch of fire doors at $1,000 a fire door bundled as, as uh, uh, all components with a total of less than $10,000. And uh, I typically put a line item in of X dollars a year, every year for those components without going through the arduous task of defining ceiling fans and light fixtures and things like that. I basically set up a single line item for all of those items with, with a disclosure so people know what they're getting. And so the other thing that's commonly misunderstood is another lawsuit I'm aware of right now that people say that when you have all these components, the roof, the painting, you know, the parking lot, you have to have a separate reserve account for each one. No, you don't. That's, they are certainly have to have a separate account, but account is not a bank account. Think of it as like a chart of account or a puka that you're gonna say, okay, I'm, count, I'm accounting for the money coming in. Some of that's gonna go to the roof. You know, we, the law is very clear and the uh, DCCA has published information on that, that you don't need a separate bank account, but you do need to have a separate accounting for every component within that reserve study. So each year when you do your reserve study and you have a million dollars in the bank, you should be able to say 150,000 for the roof, 100,000 for the parking lot or whatever it may be. So you need to have an accounting of that and a definition. Those of you who use uh, reserve specialists, their software does all that for you. So you don't really have to put too much time in that. But then we said, you know, that we have to define as a matter of law, whether you did cash flow funding or percent funding. I do a whole show on that subject, but the reality of it is just like cash and accrual accounting, there's two methods to do reserve studies. There's the component method and the pooling method. The component method measures the funding status as a percentage. The pooling method measures it as a cash flow of 20 years in Hawaii. Now, the national standards, by the way, is 30 years. And I think you'll see legislation this year to make the requirements for the pooling method to be 30 years instead of 20, because it's helpful to actually plan and have more time to collect than being able to conceal or hide things because it's a newer project. Just intentionally or unintentionally depress the amount of money you need for reserves. And then all of a sudden, uh, but when, if it's a 30 year component, now it's a 20 year component left. All of a sudden you have a big push to have to raise the reserve contribution significantly to make up for the 10 years you didn't fund. So, but under the statute, you have to do a reserve study annually and it has to meet certain criteria where you've defined the components, their useful life. That's how much life they have when they're brand new. Their remaining life, that's how much you think they have left before you have to replace it. Your estimated replacement costs in today's standards, 2022. And you have to then uh, ask yourself whether you have either met the criteria for percent funded and or cash flow funding. And I would tell you that in America and Hawaii, 99.9% .9 of all condos use the cash flow funding method under the pooling method of doing a reserve study because it's been proven over and over again that the, uh, the uh, program of using uh, 
percent funded brings very erratic results as far as having to change your contribution amounts over time, particularly when you have larger associations with so many components that these variances have impact or, or swing on all of that. And that's the requirement. And you have to ask yourself now, did my budget meet those requirements? Do I have a reserve study that's been updated for 2022? Have I disclosed what it's done on a, a percent funded or cash flow method of accounting, the funding plan? Have I defined all the requirements of all the components or lives replating costs? Because you know, the statute or administrative rules also requires you, when you project that 20 years, you've got to consider inflation and interest earnings on your money. So it's a little more complicated, but I would tell you clearly, uh, you can do it yourself or smaller associations without much hassle. Um, and so long as you made a good faith effort, the statute gives you uh, a safe haven that you can't be sued. And actually, if you could be sued because uh, you did, you intentionally breached the duty. Um, it really limits uh, the board's liability to uh, forcing uh, the association to do a proper reserve study, and that cost of the owner forcing you to do a proper reserve study is refundable to the owner and could be assessed by an arbitrator or judge against the directors individually, theoretically. I have not seen that happen. I've saw, actually I saw it happen in one case where an association board president did some not so good things that uh, he ended up being uh, um, put in a situation where he had to make a contribution uh, to the owner for the, for the cost. So on that note, I'm kind of going to summarize now that if you've done your budget reserve study, you should go back and look at it. Because the magic word about reserve, not reserve study, I should say the budget, which includes the reserve study, is it can be amended at any time. It's very easy to take a budget you've approved and amend it because you have new information or because you want to make sure the disclosures are properly known to everybody. And so I would caution you and advise you to go back and look at it, review the law, review it with your managing agent and try to do the best you can to give proper disclosures to your owners. And whatever you do, use real numbers so that you're not just suppressing the maintenance fees because you just don't wanna realize that as reported today, I think inflation was 7%. And uh, I'm not sure associations don't get the same inflationary pressure as everybody else. So on that note, thank you for watching Condo Insider. I'll be back in three weeks to talk about fraud. And I have a great guest, so it was a great CPA on all the different types of fraud that have occurred in condos. And you'll find that quite interesting on ways and means to help you protect yourself against that. Aloha, and thank you for dialing into Condo Insider. And we're here every Thursday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha.